Welcome to NCLEX RN Review, produced by Nursing Tutorial and Consulting Services. This DVD is on neurosensory. I'm Judy Miller, and I'll be your guide. The first section we're going to talk about is assessment tests. We're going to start right off with a question. The school nurse is screening children with a Snellen chart. Which cranial nerve is being tested? One, two, three, or four? That's right, the answer is number two. And remember that the Snellen chart is the chart that tests for vision. So it's the chart that in adults has the letters and the adult has to say what letters they are. In children, there may be animal pictures. And cranial nerve number two is the optic nerve, and that, of course, deals with vision. Now, we know that there are a number of questions on NCLEX relating to cranial nerves. So we're going to do another question about cranial nerves. The nurse is doing pupil checks on a brain-injured client. Which cranial nerve is being tested? Now notice that these answer choices are, the numbers do not correspond to the cranial nerve numbers. So we're looking at answer choice number one is optic nerve. Answer choice number two is oculomotor. Answer choice number three was trochlear. And answer choice number four is abducens. So pupil checks on a brain injured client, the correct answer is number two, oculomotor. And remember that this is the one that deals with pupils. Now these answer choices, if we take another look at that question, these answer choices are a little bit tricky because all four of these have something to do with vision. Number, answer choice number one, the optic nerve, of course, we just did that question. That has to do with, with vision, with seeing. Uh, ocular motor has to do with pupils. And trochlear and abducens have to do also with eye movements. Let's do another question. You are assessing cranial nerve six in a client. You will. Choice number one, ask the client to shrug his or her shoulders. Choice number two, shine a flashlight in the client's eyes and observe the pupils. Choice number three, ask the client to watch your finger as you move it from side to side. And choice number four, open a vial of cloves and ask the client to identify the scent. And the correct answer is answer number three. Ask the client to watch your finger as you move it from side to side. Cranial nerve six is the abducens nerve. Now I often think about abducens as being abduction, moving it from side to side. Let's take a look at, those quest at that question again. Answer choice number one. Ask the client to shrug his or her shoulders. Which cranial nerve would that be testing? That would be testing cranial nerve number 11. That's the spinal accessory nerve. All right, if we look at the second choice, it said shine a flashlight in the client's eyes and observe the pupils. That, as you correctly identified in the previous question, is the ocular motor nerve. And the fourth choice we had there, open a vial of cloves and ask the client to identify the scent. That deals with the olfactory nerve, which is cranial nerve number one. Now, you might be getting the idea that you really need to know your cranial nerves in order to pass NCLEX. And that is true. We've been seeing a lot of questions about cranial nerve on NCLEX recently. So let's take a look at all the cranial nerves and you really need to know all of these. So if you notice in the middle, there's S's and M's. S is for sensory, M is for motor. Cranial nerve number one is olfactory, and that's smell. And we uh, talked about how you would assess that with 
giving them some pungent smell like clothes and asking them to identify it. Number two, vision, we've talked about that. And three, ocular motor. Four, trochlear, that's the downward and inward eye movements. And six is also eyes, that's abducens, that's the lateral eye movements. Cranial nerve number five is the trigeminal nerve. There's a disease that goes with that. Do you remember what that is? That's right, it's trigeminal neuralgia. We'll talk about that a little later. Cranial nerve number seven is the facial nerve. There's a disease that goes with that. That's right, it's Bell's palsy. And we'll talk about that a little later as well. Cranial nerve number five is the trigeminal nerve. It has a disease associated with that. Do you remember what it is? That's right, it's trigeminal neuralgia. And cranial nerve number seven, the facial nerve, also has a disease associated with that. That's right, Bell's palsy. Now if we move on down, cranial nerve eight is auditory. Nine, glossopharyngeal, that deals with tongue, pharynx, and swallowing. The name tells you what it does, right? Glosso is tongue, pharyngeal for pharynx. Cranial nerve number 10 is the vagus nerve. This is a very important nerve. It deals with pharynx, larynx, and also the parasympathetic nervous system. In a few minutes, we're going to talk about this one in much more detail. Cranial nerve number 11 is the spinal accessory nerve. And as you recall, the way you assess that is to ask the patient to shrug his or her shoulders, uh, and that attests for that nerve. Cranial nerve number 12 is the hypoglossal nerve. Notice that is tongue movement. Isn't it interesting that the tongue gets the last word, uh, so to speak? Now, I did want us to go back and talk a little bit about the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve, vagus nerve. This deals with pharynx and larynx, but also the parasympathetic nervous system. This is really important. Now, this vagus nerve is a very, very long nerve. Obviously, it's a cranial nerve, so it goes from your head, and it has branches that innervate pharynx and larynx. It goes down and has branches that innervate the heart. Uh, and it tells the heart, slow down, take it easy. Then there are branches that go down into the uh, stomach and the GI tract, promotes gastric secretions and peristalsis, and the end of that vagus nerve is down in the rectum. Now, you've heard the expression vasovagal response, and what happens is if someone is um, bearing down at stool, doing Valsalva's maneuver, so they're putting pressure down in the rectal area, and they put pressure on the vagus nerve, this slows down the heart rate. So the heart rate slows down dramatically. And then when they let go, poosh, the heart rate goes up very rapidly. So this is your vasal vagal response. So let me give you a, a quick example of that. I'm thinking of a patient who had a um, GI bleed, a massive bleeding ulcer. And as you recall, when patients have massive bleeding ulcers, they um, will often pass tarry stool. So all of a sudden, this patient has this uh, sudden evacuation of tarry stool. At the time that that mass, massive bleeding, that tarry stool is there, putting pressure on the vagus nerve, the pulse, the heart rate goes down to 20. Then after the passage of that tarry stool and the pressure is relieved from the vagus nerve, the heart rate goes up to 120 with PVCs. And this is the danger then of that vasovagal response. Uh, so this is why it's so important for cardiac patients not to engage in the Valsalva's maneuver. So that's gonna have a lot of, you can hear about that not only in neuro but also in cardiac especially as well. All right, now let's move on and let's do a question. An adult has been receiving gentamicin IV every eight hours for several days. Which finding, if present, is most suggestive of an adverse reaction to the drug? One, WBC of 8,000, two, tinnitus, three, itching, or four, nasal stuffiness? 
And the correct answer to this question is number two, tinnitus. Tinnitus, as you remember, is ringing of the ears. Now, a major side effect of gentamicin is eighth cranial nerve damage. And eighth cranial nerve, as you recall, is the auditory nerve. So eighth cranial nerve damage. Now let's do another question. An adult has been receiving gentamicin IV every eight hours. Which laboratory test should the nurse monitor on a regular basis? CBC and hemoglobin, BUN and serum creatinine, AST and ALT, or urine and blood cultures? And the correct answer is number two, BUN and serum creatinine. Now what are these testing? That's right, those are tests of renal function. You need to remember that a major side effect of gentamicin is kidney damage or renal damage. Now, just so you'll never forget that, you might want to, to draw on a piece of paper just the general shape of the outer ear. Don't get too fancy, just the general shape of the outer ear. And now right next to it, draw the general shape of the kidney. What do you notice? They're essentially the same shape. So whenever you have ototoxicity, ear toxicity, then you're likely to get nephro or renal toxicity, kidney toxicity. It's interesting, but if you look at the drugs, you're going to find this to be true. Even aspirin has ringing in the ears and also has nephrotoxicity. Let's take a quick look back at that question again. Now, I wanted you to look at answer choice number three, AST and ALT. What do these measure? These are measures of liver function. Um, some drugs have liver toxicity, but not this drug. I want you to look at one more thing about this question before we leave it. Um, if you look at the way the question is worded, it says, which laboratory tests should the nurse monitor on a regular basis? That, the way that question is worded would effectively eliminate answer choice number four. Urine or blood cultures, whichever would be appropriate, would be done prior to starting gentamicin and possibly after the completion of the course of therapy but they would not be need, to, need to be done on a regular basis. So sometimes I just point out the trickiness of how some questions are worded. Another thing I want us to look at as we start to talk about the nervous system is the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is extremely important. Uh, if you understand the autonomic nervous system, you understand so much uh, about not only in the nervous system, but cardiac, GI, and side effects of psych drugs. So let's take a look at it. In the, there are two branches, as you know, to the autonomic nervous system. There's the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Now, I like to refer to the sympathetic system as the emergency response system, and the parasympathetic more as the maintenance system. So we're going to focus for the first moment here on the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, sometimes we call this the fight and flight system. It is also called adrenergic. And you notice that it is adrenergic because the neurotransmitter here is adrenaline. Hence the name adrenergic system. Now, I'd like for you to do something uh, to help me make you understand this. Just for a moment, if you can think of yourself as cave people. So just imagine yourself to be your way, 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 way far back ancestors, cave people. And we are all sitting outside our caves on a nice, make it a warm spring evening. We are enjoying the warm evening. I think we're chewing on maybe some roasted Tyrannosaurus Rex. And we're chomping away, enjoying our dinner, talking about the events of the day. And along comes a woolly mammoth. They go, Row! Okay, now, when the woolly mammoth went, Row! what happened to your heart rate? Up, 
what happened to your respiratory rate? Up. What happened to the pupils of your eyes? They dilated so you could see to run away, find the tree, and climb that tree to get away from the woolly mammoth. And I'm wondering also what happened to the uh, Tyrannosaurus rex that we were meat that we were chomping on, that stuff that probably tastes like fried chicken. So we're chomping away on that. What happens to that? Your digestion comes to a screaming halt. Now some people get rid of excess baggage. They may vomit, defecate, or urinate to make it easier to run away. Others, it might just sit there like a you know, big hard lump. But digestion comes, comes to a screech and halt because your energy, your blood supply is needed to run away, find a tree, and climb that tree and get away from that woolly mammoth that was attacking you. Now, your blood supply is in your deep muscles so that you can run away. It's not in your fingers and toes, for instance. It's in the deep muscles. Now uh, you understand what I mean when, we, when it says uh, on the bottom of that slide there, it said cave person, when you think about the autonomic nervous system. That's, so now you know about cave person, we just did our little cave person exercise. But that's your emergency system, your sympathetic system, the fight and flight system. Now, it was very important and it worked extremely well for your ancestors, and I have that on great authority because you're all here. So it worked for your ancestors and mine. We don't have very many woolly mammoths anymore, but we do have a lot of things that stimulate our sympathetic nervous system, from being scared for that next test that you're facing, uh, to the traffic and the other drivers on the highway as you uh, go to class or work. All right, now acting opposite to the sympathetic nervous system is the parasympathetic system. This I often like to call the maintenance system. It is also referred to as cholinergic because the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. There's actually another way you can remember that, and that is to think of it as promoting colon function, peristalsis or GI tract function. Now those colons aren't spelled the same, colon and cholinergic, but it's just another memory tool. It's another way to remember what happens with the parasympathetic or cholinergic nervous system. Now notice that this cholinergic system is opposite to the um, adrenergic or the sympathetic system. It slows the heart rate. This is the vagus nerve that we talked about a few minutes ago. It tends to constrict the pupils. Remember, when you're looking at close range, your pupils constrict. So, and when you're looking far away, they dilate. So with the adrenergic system, they dilated when we were looking to find the tree and run away from the woolly mammoth. But with cholinergic system, when you're thinking more about digestion and eating, think of that as being at close range. So your pupils constrict. The bronchi tend to constrict. You don't need a lot of extra oxygen for that. Uh, the blood vessels tend to dilate, which will tend to drop your blood pressure, which is opposite of what the sympathetic system did. And it promotes peristalsis. So you can see we have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system acting opposite to each other. So if you take a look at that slide and note the differences, that the sympathetic is that emergency that speeds things up, speeds up the heart rate, the respiratory rate, the blood pressure, and stops digestion. Whereas the parasympathetic system slows the pulse rate, the blood pressure, but promotes uh, peristalsis and digestion. Now it's really important for us that we remember and can make some sense of this autonomic nervous system. And I'm going to take a few moments as we talk about this to think about its effects on drugs. Because I want you to be able to tie the, this part of the, the autonomic nervous system to the actions of drugs. So adrenergic drugs are those drugs that stimulate the, the sympathetic or the adrenergic nervous system. So these are drugs that will raise blood pressure. So they might be used for conditions such as shock, epinephrine or adrenaline as an example of an adrenergic drug. 
Adrenergic drugs also dilate bronchioles, so they can be used for conditions like asthma, where you have bronchial constriction. Again, epinephrine or a drug like aminophilin uh, would be examples of bronchodilators. Now, side effects of adrenergic drugs, these drugs are going to increase the heart rate. So tachycardia is a major side effect. Other side effects can be urinary retention and nausea and vomiting because, after all, it's slowing down that parasympathetic system. It's increasing the sympathetic, and that means that there's a decrease in the parasympathetic functioning. Now, if we take the opposite type of thing and think about adrenergic blockers, they're all over the place. So adrenergic blockers decrease blood pressure. And we have two categories of drugs uh, that are often uh, used for that. The beta blockers, and you can always tell them when you see them because they're olols, that's their family name. And the alpha blockers are zosins, that's their family names. Those just simply say which of the two fibers of the adrenergic fibers are blocked by those drugs. So they, they, they decrease blood pressure. They also slow the heart rate. So people with rapid heartbeats may often be given beta blockers. They, you sometimes see an adrenergic blocker like Tamoptic being used to decrease intraocular pressure. Now, I want us now to think about cholinergic drugs. Cholinergics are uh, stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system. So cholinergic drugs, one use of a cholinergic drug would be to increase the amount of acetylcholine, and this could be used for conditions such as myasthenia gravis. So drugs like neostigmine, prostigmine being a trade name, or adrophonium, tensilon is the trade name. Now, which one of these drugs the uh, tensilon or prostigmine is used to diagnose myasthenia gravis. That's right, it's tensilon. And then the neostigmine or, or the prostigmine is used to treat um, uh, myasthenia gravis. Another example of the use of cholinergics is to promote peristalsis. In people who might have abdominal distension or paralytic ileus, so a drug like uh, uracoline is used for that purpose. Uracoline can also be used to treat urinary retention. So those are some examples of cholinergic drugs. Now, there's one more way that we can go with these drugs, and these are anticholinergic drugs that are going to block the parasympathetic nervous system. Anticholinergics are used for a number of purposes. Anticholinergics, you often think of drugs like atropine being used to dry secretions, perhaps for postoperative, postoperatively for patients going to surgery, excuse me, preoperatively for patients going to surgery. Uh, so you might see atropine being used as a preoperative drug. Another one, uh, robinol, uh, is is a anticholinergic uh, used to dry secretions preoperatively. You might also see it being used uh, to slow or decrease peristalsis. And you see a couple of drugs there, uh, dicyclamine, antispaz, or hycosamine, uh, cystospaz, can be used to decrease peristalsis. Anticholinergics are sometimes used in motion sickness drugs. Uh, the drug scopolamine uh, is in a lot of your motion sickness drugs. It can also, you'll see some of these drugs being used in your over-the-counter um, cold medications, things to dry up your secretions when you have a cold, are also anticholinergics. Anticholinergics can be used to increase the heart rate. Sometimes atropine is used for that purpose as well. Let's take a look at the side effects of the anticholinergic drugs. When you know the side effects of the anticholinergic drugs, you know the side effects of many drugs, not only from the nervous system, 
but also drugs that are being used in the gastrointestinal system because we use a lot of anticholinergics there. And the side effects of virtually all of your psychiatric drugs are also anticholinergic. So once you know these side effects, you really um, know the side effects of many drugs. So because the anticholinergics cause the pupils to dilate, then patient, we often say they can't see. They really aren't blind, but they have blurred vision. Now, the anticholinergics also make it difficult to open the urinary sphincter, and so we get urinary retention as a side effect. So this little poem that I'm about to teach you, it's, it's a little bit funny, but it makes it easy to remember. Can't see, can't pee. Now, anticholinergics cause a dry mouth, so can't spit. And they cause a slowing of the GI tract all the way down, completely down. So at the other end of the GI tract, something that rhymes with spit, now I don't usually say this word because it's not terribly polite, but that tells you about constipation or another side effect. So in summary, if you want to remember the side effects of anticholinergic drugs, can't see, can't pee, can't spit, can't sh something that rhymes with spit and is at the other end of the GI tract. So now that's your easy way to remember side effects of anticholinergic drugs. And you'll never miss a question on that now. Let's take a look at another question. The nurse is caring for an adult who had a spinal tap. How should the nurse position the patient in the immediate post-procedure period? So one semi-sitting, two prone, three upright, or four head lower than feet. Now spinal tap is just another terminology for a lumbar puncture. So how should we position a patient who just had a lumbar puncture in the immediate post-procedure period? That's right, the best answer of those there is prone. Now that's not the answer you were looking for. You were probably looking for flat. Most books will tell you put them flat. Uh, but prone is actually better than supine because if, if you think about it, there's a little hole there and the, the, they are at risk for losing cerebral spinal fluid out of that little um, puncture wound. And that can cause spinal headache. So if we put them in a prone position on their abdomen, there's even less risk of loss of cerebral spinal fluid. Now, more, very frequently, doctors use very, very tiny little needles. And the smaller the needle, the less the risk of a spinal headache. But on that question, the best answer was prone. You don't want to sit them up, and you don't want to put their head lower than their feet. You don't want to put them in Trendelenburg position. So the one that is flat, which is probably what you learned in school, the only flat one is prone. Now, if we think about this lumbar puncture or a spinal tap, another question that can be asked about it is how do you position the patient? Now, if we note here, you want the patient positioned so that their back is arched and that opens up the spaces between the vertebrae and makes it easier then for the physician to insert the needle. <clears throat> the patient is frequently side-lying with their back arched when their knees pulled up to their chest as in this picture. Now one thing I would say about this, remember that before you position a patient in this position and expect them to stay there when somebody's sticking a needle in their back, you might want to have them empty their bladder first. It's pretty difficult to stay in that position without emptying the bladder. Sometimes the patients sit up on the edge of the bed and lean on an overbed table. That also gets the same kind of arching of the back and opening up of the vertebral spaces. And remember, the post-procedure care we said, usually we recommend that they be flat. We may encourage fluids to help them remanufacture their cerebral spinal fluid. Now I want us to look at a few other diagnostic tests. I want us to talk a little bit about arteriogram. Arteriograms are used for a number of procedures, not just related to the neurological system. Um, 
Now, remember, when a needle, when an arteriogram is done, a dye is put into a large artery, and then that we can view um, what's going on with the circulation. So the dye that's used is an iodine dye, so you must check for an iodine allergy. Then other nursing care, you need to check for bleeding at the puncture site. And the other problem is clotting inside the blood vessel because that blood has, that vessel has to seal off. And the worry is that you can get too big a clot inside the blood vessel and this could disrupt circulation. So you need to check pulses distal to the insertion site. So iodine allergy before the procedure, check for that. And remember that's when you ask them, are you allergic to shellfish? And then for bleeding, at, so a hematoma at the puncture site after the procedure. And also check pulses distal to the insertion site um, to make sure that no clotting has taken place inside the blood vessel. All right, now a couple other scans to look for. A CAT scan, a CT scan. That is computerized axial tomography. Uh, oftentimes it's called CT or CAT scan. It looks something like this. There's a big, a big uh, machine, and it can scan various parts of the body. It can scan the brain, the head. It can also scan the abdomen, so it could be used for a number of different procedures. Now, this particular picture, of course, has something that's not really on every CAT scanning machine. That's uh, just a little humor for us for the moment. But with a CT scan, they usually like to use uh, a dye because that makes the picture better for the, for the physician. So you do need to ask about an iodine allergy because they do use an iodine dye. Now I want you to remember something about scans. The CT scan or the CAT scan is an x-ray and it uses an iodine dye. Most other scans, brain scan, liver scan, lung scan, thyroid scan, for instance, use radioisotopes. So most scans, except the CT scan, use a radioisotope. The CT scan is an x-ray. And x-rays are taken in layers, and then they make it, put it all together, and it has this beautiful three-dimensional image of whatever part has been scanned. All right, let's do a question. An adult is scheduled for MRI today. What question is essential for the nurse to ask the patient? One, when did you last eat? Two, are you allergic to iodine? Three, do you have any metal in your body? Or four, did you take the barium? And the correct answer is answer number three. Do you have any metal in your body. Remember that MRI or magnetic resonance imaging is where they they're put into a big machine and it creates a huge magnetic field around the body. So if there's any metal in the body it could move that metal, it could dislodge that metal. So we want to find out if there's any metal in the body. So have they ever been a metal worker? Do they have a pacemaker? That usually contraindicates an MRI, uh, a pacemaker does. So, so we need to ask that kind of question. Um, barium is not used with an MRI, and though iodine is not used with an MRI. Now let's talk a little bit about the MRI. The patient is put in a machine that looks like this. So this is a big box kind of machine. They lay on this hard table and that table is pushed right into that little round hole. Now there's another question we need to ask these patients. And that other question is, do you have claustrophobia? Because this is rather scary. If you don't have claustrophobia, an MRI machine might give it to you. Uh, it's a very small, narrow, enclosed space. And you may have your feet hanging out, but you can't tell because you can't see. So it's very scary for many patients. If patients have claustrophobia, they may indeed have to be sedated 
uh, before the procedure. And remember, if they're sedated, you must make sure that someone else is driving them home. Uh, that's, that's crucial. Uh, so that would be a safety kind of question for us. So with the MRI, the biggie issues are any metal in your body and uh, are, do you have claustrophobia? Now just another couple of words on the metal in the body. For instance, there, if people have had um, some types of uh, cosmetic surgery where they have had um, surgery that gives them uh, particular kinds of uh, eyebrows or that kind of type of thing, some tattoos, the, the procedures involve some metal so some of those have caused problems. There are certain eye um, cosmetics that can cause, um, that have metal in them and can cause a problem. So we encourage them not to wear any makeup when they come for that procedure. Uh, bobby pins, uh, hair pins, necklaces, things around the neck, that metal could, the, the magnetic field could strangle patients. So all of that kind of thing, from watches to jewelry, everything must be removed um, for the MRI. Uh, any clothing that has metal in it uh, needs to be removed. If their clothing doesn't have metal, then they can keep on their regular clothing, but no zippers, no um, bras that would have little metal pieces in them. Those must all.